This could be the start of something big. Oh, <laughs> hello. Uh, didn't see you there. Uh, I was just writing a Hawaiian musical. So, how's everybody doing? This is the premiere episode of Rob's Never Seen. That's right, we're talking about movies that somehow I just never got around to or was, you know, under my radar, never thought about again. Movies that I'm like, oh my God. And so what better movie to start off with than Casablanca? Because I have never seen a single solitary Humphrey Bogart movie. Not a single one of them. I've seen clips, but not that many. And so I thought about doing Citizen Kane, but technically I saw that once a long time ago in the 90s. And even though I was drinking a lot and smoking a lot of pot, and I don't really remember that much about it, just that it was eh, it still counts that I've seen it. So I had to pick something else that was pretty iconic, and I thought, go with Casablanca, because you've been meaning to, to watch it, you've been writing yourself that you haven't seen it, and for a brief period of time in your 20s, you smoked Chesterfield cigarettes because you thought that you would look like Humphrey Bogart when you smoked, and let me tell you, I didn't, and they sucked. <laughs> so if you haven't seen Casablanca, go watch it. Come back. Join us as we talk about this 1942 classic, technically 43 classic, that won Best Picture, Best Director, Best Screenplay, and we'll talk about it then. So watch the movie, come back if you've seen the movie, get ready for the review, and I hope you guys like it. Bye. Right. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, officially, welcome back to the channel. This is Rob here at Smirking Gun Reviews, back with the official first episode of Rob's Never Seen, the show where we discuss movies that, at this point, I really should have seen in my life. And tonight, we were going to actually watch The Treasure of the Sierra Madre, which is a movie I'd really been wanting to see for a while. But when I realized I was going to watch that movie, I knew I needed to start the series that I'd been putting off for a really long time. And if I was going to start that series, I had to pick a movie that was bigger than The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. And for some people, you go, wow, that's really big. But I needed to go epic. I needed to talk about something that I honestly, in my mind, have no right to have not have seen. Like anybody that's anybody that's a reviewer or whatever, most people have seen Casablanca. And I've never seen it. Never seen a single Humphrey Bogart film. And like I joked about, uh, you know, I went through a brief phase in my early 20s where I smoked Chesterfields because I heard that that's what Humphrey Bogart smoked. It's like people who think that they, you know, they know, you know, like they want to be like James Dean, but they didn't really know James Dean. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's just one of those stupid things. And I mean, it was 50, you know, Casablanca was 50 years old uh, when I was in, in that time period. You know, I didn't know anything. I just, you know, you're a stupid kid. But I, so I thought Casablanca, this movie that means so much to a lot of people that's so quoted uh, everywhere in the end is so iconic that I really needed to start here. I was actually toying with Citizen Kane, but I've actually seen Citizen Kane once a really long time ago. 
So I almost consider that not seeing it. And it's probably going to be eventually on this because I maybe, maybe as like a cheat. But for right now, we're not cheating at all. We're talking about Casablanca starring Humphrey Bogart, Ingrid Bergman, Claude Rains, Paul Henry, Peter Lorre, Dooley Wilson, Conrad Veidt, Madeline Lebeau, Sidney Greenstreet, S.Z. Sakal, Joy Page, John Qualen, Kurt Bois, Leonid Kinski, Ilka Gruning, and Spencer Chan. Why am I saying all those titles? Because all these people have passed, and I, I just want to kind of honor all the people in it. Well, at least it's on this list. The last surviving member of the cast of Casablanca, Madeleine Lebeau, who played Yvonne, who is the one that Rick was having a bit of a fling with at the beginning of the movie. She passed May 1st, 2016, at the age of 92. And I also put it in perspective today that it's been almost 80 years since this movie was released. So I'm watching a movie that's, you know, two, four fifths of a, a, a of a, a century old. Did I say two or four? Did I say four fifths? I don't know. It's been a long day. So I'm I'm like, I'm looking at a movie that's you know, I haven't I haven't watched a movie this old in a really long time. And it's just a trip. And, and, and being able to put myself in this movie, it's how I did it. I, it's, I'm not a big fan of old movies because I'm not a big fan of old Hollywood. And I really find how everything that they, they did, and I'm not saying that Hollywood now is much better, but I'm disgusted by what they were doing back then and the hypocrisy that they wanted to portray that people didn't live like normal lives but when you see movies like this i don't know it it changes my perspective a little bit so casablanca won the best picture best director best screenplay and i can see all of that for the time that this came out you know it was filmed in 42 released in january of 43 World War II is in full on swing, you know. And I can see why, contemporary wise and topical wise, and, you know, and how dramatic it would have been to see a movie like this back then when the world is in upheaval. There's a world war going on, and Hollywood's still making movies, and this is an, I would consider to be a very important movie. This would really hit home for a lot of people. So in that respect, it, it I, I was very, very pleased with it. I have to admit, I'm, because time has been so removed from World War II, um, you know, we've, I've, I've watched a million documentaries on World War II. I've seen all sorts of horrible pictures and films and everything. I've seen video from the, you know, I've seen film strips of concentration camps and all of that stuff isn't lost on me. But as a film, you know, it does lose some of its impact on a modern audience for me, somebody who waited this long to see it, wondering, uh, you know, would it be as awesome and classic and epic as many people consider it to be. And I do got to say that it did surprise me in a few spots, especially near the end. And I I thoroughly enjoyed this movie. I thought that the music was great. I thought that the acting was really good. And I really liked the plot and, and the setting of this. Um, because I didn't really think about like what the plot of this movie really was going to be going into it. I just thought Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman are start, you know, are people that used to love each other and eventually she gets on a plane. You know, I've seen the clips of this, you know, like it's it was impossible for me to not know some of the things that go on in this movie. But it also deals with like stuff like concentration camps and what German what the Germans were doing. 
it brings that up. You know, a lot of people didn't believe in concentration camps, and some fucking weirdos still think it didn't happen. You know, when the soldiers liberated those camps, I mean, a lot of people, it brought reality to the whole thing. Like, this is what was... And the fact that they brought this up, I thought was interesting. But the thing is, is I since I wasn't there and I don't know everything about the history of this, those stories, I can't... I don't know for sure when people really started talking about them. I think that I'm sure that there were like the talks of, I hear they're rounding people up. But the plot of this is that everybody's trying to flee uh, Europe in the middle of World War II, and there are very limited options on how to get the hell out. Everybody's trying to get to America. And. Everybody's trying to get to Lisbon because that's apparently the big way out. It's the it's the last point of Europe that it will you need to get to to get to America. That's wild to me to hear something like that. Is that true? I mean, I, I or is it just because it, it's where you were in Europe that that, that Lisbon was this key place? Because I'm sure in London, you know, like London wasn't occupied, so anybody could go to America. But I think getting to London maybe was the hard part. And getting, trying to find a, a port in occupied France and everywhere else, it would probably be much more difficult. So all these people were making this trek down to Casablanca, which is this place that would, you know, in Morocco, that would give you, you would get papers to leave Morocco. You'd have to get special visas to leave Morocco, then to go to Lisbon, and then you could go to America. But basically, being in Casablanca was like this big ass refugee holding center where you would just have be you'd be stuck there trying to barter your way, trying to buy your way, trying to smooth people into letting you leave to freedom in America. And while the Nazis have France, Casablanca is still unoccupied France. But that the authorities and everybody are trying to, you know, they're, they're French officers, but they're also trying to appease what is soon going to be, a, what, what, a, what it seemed to be, is the Nazis are coming. They just haven't gotten there yet. And so they're trying to please the Nazis that are coming there. Everybody's playing this, like, politics game. And I found that really interesting. I found that really fascinating because it's like, Germans have power, but they don't really have power. They're still kind of obeying uh, the French rules, but the French guys are trying to do whatever they can for the what for their new masters are coming. And if maybe if I'm misinterpreting that, but it just sort of seemed like that's what was going on. Um, and so people, you know, you really had nothing to do but sit and drink and wait and gamble and hope and pray that you could find somebody, somebody that would give you, you know, money. To get out, you could see there was pickpockets. There, there was a pickpocket character in this. It was always ripping people off, trying to, you know, maybe make his own way out of there. And you've got like these two clubs that people would go to. There's the Blue Parrot, and then there's Rick's Cafe Americana. And the Blue Parrot's this like kind of. It's it's a step down from Rex. Rex looks like he, it's the it, he's trying to look like the Copacabana. He's trying to give uh, the Copacabana kind of feel in the middle of the desert. And the blue parrot's like the it's like Oreo versus Hydrox. I don't know. It's the first thing that popped into my head. <laughs> you get the high quality Oreo and the Hydrox that's like trying to be the Oreo. And if you like Hydrox. Whatever. I can't believe I'm making a, a cookie. <laughs> so anyway, this was the first time I realized how old the song It Had To Be You was. Right? This is, again, four, 1940s, and that's how old that song goes back to. I just, I knew it was old. I just didn't know it was that old. Um, but everybody here is desperate. Everybody's trying to wait to get away out in any way possible. And we're introduced here to like, so Humphrey Bogart's P, uh, I'm sorry. I got to look up the cast list here because there's a lot to talk about here. Uh, Rick Blaine. Uh, 
it took me a while to figure out his motivations. It took a while for the movie to explain some things about him because on the surface, Rick is... What is Rick doing there as an American? You know what I mean? Like, that's what I was thinking. And he sure does seem to not give a crap about anybody but himself. What made Rick this way? Why is he there? What is he running from? All these different questions that slowly get peeled away. But then you kind of... You know when you don't know, there's a lot of mystery behind the guy, and I kind of like that. I kind of like that there's still some kind of vagueness. We don't know everything. We know he's, like, run guns to Ethiopia, and we know that he sided against fascism in Spain. So it's like, on the surface, he, we, how he presents himself as a guy who doesn't care, but he always seems to somehow end up helping the side of good. But right now, he's really wallowing in the desert. You know, he got, he took some, he got a, clearly made, had enough money to set himself up with a really solid place with the guy, Sam, who is with him, who, you know, we don't know why, how or why Sam is with him. We find all this out later, but it's just, it's all really interesting to me where just enter this movie with all these questions, just, I, I and, and waiting for the answers. We're introduced to Peter Laurie in this movie who plays uh ugarte peter lori man such an interesting inter interesting sounding guy and when i realized when i was listening to like all the different accents that are in this movie and when this movie came out when this movie was filmed and i realized how many people like sound this way uh in those in that time period in old hollywood was you know because it's not like there's not people that have accents but like a lot of people that were in America at the time didn't sound like a, a, like like full on Americans because they were all there was so much immigration still going on from Europe and everywhere else that a lot of these actors just had really thick accents, you know. And if that sounds weird, if that statement sounds weird to you, just I'm trying to. I'm trying to always, like, when I when I watch these older movies or I see these clips of older movies and I see the, a lot of these actors who have very thick accents, I, I just put it in my mind that that was a bigger thing now. Like, immigration from Europe isn't as common, you know, and, and as many people that were coming here from Europe because of World War II and World War I um, and, and prior to that with, you know with the early turn of the century and people coming from Ireland and everywhere else, you know, now it's, we, we've got more of the immigration coming from the South of our, of America and things like that. And so all these people coming to the country with those thick accents makes more sense. now when I see some of these Hollywood movies, it's Peter Lorre is like, like Hungarian, I think. Well, he's this sleazy guy who, the beginning, he's kind of like the guy who kicks off the movie. Because there's these two German guys that are killed. Uh, and they had letters of transit that could get people out of the country, no questions asked. These are very highly sought after documents. He killed these guys and took the documents because he's holding them for a man named Victor Laszlo, who is a concentration camp escapee who is fleeing and trying to get out of the country to Lisbon because he's like a big activist. He's trying to get people to pay attention to what's going on. And he's supposed to meet Ugarte for these papers. But before he can get to Ugarte, he, Ugarte is arrested in very violent fashion. I really enjoyed this section, actually, when they went to arrest him and he's getting his chips together he, and he's got his money and he just kind of bolts and turns the gun and just starts firing into the like guards that are coming after him and how he pleads with Rick, you gotta help me, Rick. It, it's just, I, I really didn't, you know, I thought, I, I don't know, I, I guess... I didn't expect it to go down that hard. And I was kind of impressed with that. I also like just Rick, how many, like, how many famous lines Rick says in this movie. Things like, you know, he's like, you really don't like me, do you, Rick? He's like, if I gave you any thought, I probably would. And I don't mind a parasite, just not a cut rate one. Like, there's just so many awesome lines. And when you say it, like where Humphrey Bogart says things, it's just instantly, uh, I don't know. Like, we just don't have 
Hollywood leading men that remind me of guys from this era. They they were cut from a different cloth, and whether that's good or bad, right? Because a lot of stories come out about a lot of these people. A lot of pe- stories come out of people, you know, about people today. You know, people aren't who they say they are, what they seem, and blah blah blah. But these people coming out of World War One, World War Two, they were cut from a different cloth than we are today, as far as like the way life was back then. Life was like tougher and harder in a in a whole different way than what it's hard like now. And when you think of leading men, there just aren't people like Humphrey Bogart anymore. There just aren't. There's some classical looking guys that, you know, you can say that they have that look, but not the behavior. And so it's just watching this guy is like looking back into like a whole other world that's just gone now. And I found that really fascinating. Um, so you've got Louis, Louis, who I, I was one of my favorite characters in this movie played by, uh, Claude Rains. What a wild card this guy is, right? He's the corrupt French officer who can get you out, but also can screw you over, who's will do just about any like it, it they've alluded to the fact that he like you know will sleep around with these women desperate women that that want to get out of the country he he plays both sides uh this isn't a character i expected to really see in this movie at out again because i didn't really know what to expect from this movie but i really thought claude rains was fantastic in this movie uh, it makes me uh, hopeful that I run into his this actor uh, down the road in other movies. Um, so this is eventually Ilsa and Laszlo enter the picture, and Ilsa played by Ingrid Bergman, who is whew, wow, <laughs> like she. I didn't expect her to actually like. I look at a lot of pictures of older Hollywood women, and just to. On just general looks, right? Attractiveness or whatever. I don't find a lot of the older Hollywood actresses, even the ones that a lot of people do find attractive, I just don't. But Ingrid Bergman, ooh, <laughs> that's something else. Um, but when she first arrives, there is a, there was a line that she says, and we and it was mentioned in the uh, viewing party that we were watching this on, where she calls Sam the piano man boy the boy playing the piano and yeah that was a little that was about the only rough line uh that you know maybe it wouldn't hold up now unless somebody was just making a period piece you know like you couldn't say that in just any general sense anymore um but we find out that ilsa knew rick in paris and this is where we start to get Everything starts to fall into place about what was going on with Rick in the first place. So we find out that like there's a price on Rick's head, right? And that they had this whole relationship in Paris. Like she shows up, she sees Sam. Sam plays, you know, as time goes by, play for me one last time, Sam, you know, just... And when Rick hears that song playing... He just about loses his shit. Because we don't know why at first, but it's her favorite song. It's a song that they played in Paris. And it's just, it churns up all the old emotions that Rick had been running from. And, and, whole, and, and, and trying to forget about. And it's... We find out that they had this whole relationship in Paris. That they met each other. This is before France got taken over. They have this whirlwind romance. It's done very quickly, um, but I still bought it. That by the time the Germans come, he and her are going to leave. But she leaves him at the train station heartbroken. 
distraught, destroyed, you know, like she says, you, you know, I, I can't go with you. I can never see you again, blah, blah, blah. And he's just completely dejected. And we, you know, he leaves and ends up in Casablanca with Sam. And not knowing what happened to her. And, and now she's back in his life and she's with some other guy. And he even like proposed to her in France. And what you, and now like I didn't know like how impactful that scene was supposed to be until a little bit later because he's like, look, baby, I'll marry you like and everything. And she's just like, kiss me like if it's the last time we'll ever see each other, you know, and. They're both pretty heartbroken characters. Well, Louis and the rest of the Nazis and the French officers, they all are still trying to look for the letters of transit. And I love, like, this whole thing with Victor Laszlo being in Ca uh, in Casablanca. It's like he's... The Germans are there. He's on the run. He's an escaped concentration camp, you know, victim. They want him back. And yet... They can't really do anything while he's in Casablanca, but they won't let him leave. And they don't want him to, they, they really know what to do with him if he stays. They figure, you know, once everything is taken over, he'll be able to legally be taken into custody, which felt a little weird to me because it feels like Nazis don't wait. You know, if they wanted him, they'd just kill him in the streets. But as long as, it, the longer Laszlo is there, the more things start to feel weird for the Nazis because they realize that he has influence. Um, and they bring it, I, I, there's this scene where they ask him to come in. Like the German, the Nazi German, <laughs> it's hard, you know, wants him to come into the police station. The French, you know, Officer Louis is like, well, we request you to come in. And when they when he does come in, I love this scene because it's like this. It's just supposed to be this polite business. They they treat everything like just we're just there for a meeting. When all I'm thinking is this polite business feels like a real threatening. It felt like this the beginning scene in Inglorious Bastards where you're just waiting for something terrible to happen, but it doesn't. It because it's just a different kind of situation. That and I've first probably seen too many movies, but. I just really loved that, that that tense feeling that something was about to go wrong. And we find out that Ilsa has been married to Laszlo since even before she met Rick. That Laszlo went into a... They were married. Laszlo got sent back to where he... In Czechoslovakia. He got put in a concentration camp and she was told that he was killed. So she thought that she was, you know, she was lonely. She thought he was dead. And so when she met Rick, they fell in love, you know, and how difficult that must have been for her in the first place to fall in love with somebody again so fast, so soon after everything. Maybe it was just kind of the circumstances of needing somebody to fall back on. And then it got more intense and, and out of, you know, like and it got what she thought it was going to be. Um... So, at this point, Rick is still just, like, really distraught. He's pissed off at her. She's desperate and sad. And by desperate, I mean desperate to leave, to help get her husband out. And this is where we first see, like, this kink in Rick's armor, where one another couple that we see in the background of a few scenes that's trying to get out as well, uh, she comes up, the wife comes up to Rick and really wants, she's like saying, Louis can, the, can get us out, but I don't know if he'll keep his word. And she's basically saying she's got to sleep with this guy to get us out. And he's trying, you know, and, but will he, will he follow through? Will, if we do what he wants me, you know, wants me to do to get him out of there. Will he follow through? And Rick's like, well, you you know, he's, I've never known him not to keep his word. But Rick goes a step further and, like, has his own roulette dealer cheat twice to get the guy enough money so that he can just pay Louis off for the letters of transit. And also puts him in this weird position 
where he's kind of like, well, you can't really back out now. They've got all this money. And Louis pissed off because Rick kind of interfered with his little dalliance that he wanted to have with the woman. Um, I love it though. He's like, when they get the money, he's like, cash your chips in, get the hell out, don't ever come back. <laughs> like, you got to get out of here. Like, I'm doing you a favor, but you got to go. Now, Laszlo then co finally comes to Rick about the letters of transit because he has no way out and the, 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 no the noose is getting closer. Like, the net around him is getting closer. You can feel the walls closing in on all the characters, actually, in this movie as time goes on, as time goes by. But I'm bummed. And he's trying to appeal to Rick's better nature, talking about how he fought against the fascists and everything, and nothing's working, and Rick finally just goes, why don't you ask your wife why I won't help you? <laughs> and I love that. But before he can do that, the Germans are down in the bar playing their music, and Laszlo can't help himself but to play French, the you know the French national anthem, over there. Is that so? It overtakes the German music, and the Germans go back to their table, kind of like, you know, like oh well, they like you know like they've been pushed out, and that's not what you you know Nazis are being gracious. <laughs> and so this was a big big mistake, and they. Rick's place is forced to be closed down by the Nazis. Even Louis doesn't want to do this. Where we get the... And it's this around here in this line where we get the, the famous line, in Casablanca, life is che human life is cheap. And all I could think was, it still is, buddy, but it's everywhere. Life is cheap everywhere. And that Rick's now saying, you know, like, I'm the only cause that I'm interested in. Throughout this whole movie, he says things like that. Um, I stick my neck out for nobody. He says that at least twice. And while that's like pretty on the nose foreshadowing that he's going to have a change of heart, it didn't, it still was interesting to get, go on this journey. Especially when Ilsa shows up in his house ready to, you know, she's trying to steal the tr letters of transit. She's, des you know, like, this is where it's come to for her. He's not going to help her. He, he can't forget the past. They need to leave. And how she puts it is like, one woman hurt you and you take it out on the rest of the world. And the thing is, is like, I've, we've, that story is true. How, one thing can happen to somebody and they will... Make the whole world pay. Happens every single day. And it's it's just a pretty true statement. And, and, it, and it was like thinking about that and how, how that comes back along at the end of the movie when Rick really is, she really makes him face everything. Because there is love there. And he feels it and she feels it. And it's all just this really tragic set of circumstances where... You know, the man that she married turned out not to be dead. She goes back to him, but yet she still loves, she loves two men. But she is honoring the commitment that she had with the first man. And you can't fault her for that. But she also, it's like in that time after he died, she, I think she falls, you know, as she's kind of puts it, like she doesn't even want to be with Laszlo anymore. She's just kind of, she loves him, but she wants to move on. And Rick loves her and wants to have her. But there's also that part of him, that noble part of him that knows that he's no good to, for her anymore. Like, if this would have been Paris and she had come with him to the train station and, and they went, ran off together, it'd be a different story. But the life, things have happened. Life happened the war happened all these things happened he's not the same anymore and i just feel like he's trying to find the noble way out of this to save her and him but at first it really looks like he's not gonna help even when she pulls the gun on him and he's like i'm gonna die here in casablanca you know as good as place as any and if you're gonna shoot me which because she pulls a gun then you'd be doing me a favor now, he, she and him have a moment. She explains everything that's going on in their lives that had happened. And he says that he's leaving with Elsa. We're going to leave together. She's like, all right. Then we see Rick talking to Louie, and it appears he's setting...
up to like, hey, you know, look, I just want to get out with her. I'm going to give you him. Give you like way more juice in with the Nazis. I just need guarantees. I need your men to not be anywhere near here. All right. It's just you and me and them. You can take them in and then we're going to bounce. And it really felt sincere of what he was doing. The only thing was is that because I know at the end he doesn't end up on the plane with her, I was like, okay, well, it was a little easy for me to see through that plot. If I had never known, if I had never known any of that stuff, I would have completely believed that Bogey was turning Laszlo in. And I almost kind of wish that that's the way the story went because it would have been just super dark. But <laughs> it still ends fantastically. He, I mean, he even sells his place. And so Laszlo and Ilsa show up. Louis gets the drop on them, like, hey, you know, you're coming with me. And that's when Rick turns on Louis and says, nope, this is not how it's going to go down. They're leaving. You're coming with us. You're going to call the airport. Tell them to just me, you know, don't, don't, you know, we just want them to be ready for when we leave. But when Louis, but Louis does something that I didn't see coming and he doesn't call the airport. He actually calls Strausser, the Nazi, and says, you know, gives, says what Rick wants him to say, but says it to Strausser, the Nazi, and Rick doesn't know that. And so the Nazi is on his way to the airport. They get to the airport. And so it's like this race against the clock to get the plane off the ground. And... This is when she finds out that he's not going. Like, she doesn't understand yet. You know, like, he had to leave her in the dark. Otherwise, she might not agree to do what he needs her to do, which is get on that plane and live your life. You'll be, you'll be better off. She will be better off. And the whole thing, like, all those lines that might seem a little cheesy to me, like, you know, the, the, the three of us don't mount to a hill of beans in this, you know, crazy world where everything else is going to hell. Like, the world's got bigger problems than us. And, you know, the whole, you might not regret it today or tomorrow, but soon. It all makes much more sense in context now for me. He's doing the noble thing. He's sacrificing himself, not just for love, but because this is what he really is like on the inside. What he's done his whole life. We just only got to see him at this one point in his life. Where he was wallowing in misery in the middle of the fucking desert. Trying to forget his problems. And pretty much drink and smoke his life away until he died. And her showing up and, and everything that went down actually kind of rejuvenated his life too. And while she may be getting on that plane and leaving. He's also not going ready to die even though it does seem like he's about to. So they get on the plane and, you know, this is also the, the, the movie that has the here's looking at you, kid. Um, but Strausser shows up and Rick tells him, don't go near the phone. Don't you try calling the radio tower to hold back this plane. And Rick shoots the guy. And that's when the French authorities pull up and it's like, well, Rick's fucked. Like, I, I expected it, right? I was like, Rick is going to die here. He said he was going to die at Casablanca. So, this is it. Except, Louis doesn't say that Rick did anything. He just says the same line that he did in, earlier in the movie when there was a crime committed. Round up the usual suspects. So, he lets, he, he lets the Nazi die... He lets Rick kill him, and he's now playing a different side. Louis is now flipped. Now, it doesn't mean he's a character that you can fully trust, but we, we never see these characters again. But it's like Louis made a, a choice, and that choice was to not side with the Nazis and side with the, the victory that they have. Letting these people go it was the right thing to do, and Louis turns out to be like kind of a redemptive character in the end. And they, they go off. And it also explains the goddamn line of Louis, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. I never understood what that meant until now. Is that these two guys are going to leave Casablanca and whatever. Like, they're <laughs> the adventures of Louis and Rick. And it's just, I, I was literally, like, I went, like, wow. 
wow, I did not expect that ending. In fact, the way I saw this movie ending was just the plane taken off and that's it. And he's just doomed in Casablanca. So it's like the line that somebody said, if you wow him in the end. Yeah, it's from the movie adaptation. When Brian Cox says, wow him in the end and you got yourself a hit. And they, this movie was a journey. It was a process. There was a lot of things going on. But that ending, when it all just pays off, and the unexpected ending happened for me, because it was unexpected to me, made it all worthwhile and very happy experience. I was so happy that this didn't end in a way that just... I was worried. I didn't want, I didn't want the first one of these to be like, oh, that sucked. <laughs> but it didn't suck. Do I think it's as great as everybody thinks it is? I think it's really good. But I still also, like, I have to put things in context. And it's like, I can understand why it won all the awards at the time. If this was made today, it might still have a shot at winning, like, Best Picture. Um, it'd have to be a little more modernized. As far as the dialogue and the writing goes and things like that. It'd have a better location. It'd be filmed on location. You know, um... Would it be as topical? No, but people still love World War II movies. Um, and so, yeah, this is definitely a bona fide classic movie, and I'm glad that almost 80 years later after it was released, after, you know, and let's call it 30 years since I should have seen this movie, so it would have been 50 years at the time, I finally get to see it. And it, it, it definitely exceeded my expectations. And I'm really glad that I could finally say I've seen Casablanca instead of Rob's never seen it. So anyway, that was the first episode of these. If you like this review, please hit the like button, comment, share, subscribe, hit the bell for all notifications. The next one we are doing is going to be The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. Uh, it'll be happening soon. I don't know how soon. I've got a lot on my plate. But if you hated Everything I had to say because you're like, how did this guy get this movie review so wrong? Well, we can give you the last 40-ish minutes of your life back. So if you did like this film, please put on shades, look away, and if you have epilepsy or any other light sensitivity, please get out of the room as we give the people who hated this a better memory. Here's looking at you, kid. And here's hopefully... A better memory that you could get rather than watching what I said. Bye. Five talented men have been chosen for the lifetime achievement in the field of comedy. Steve Allen. It will be the start of Suckling Pig. Hi, I was just writing a Hawaiian musical. I am uh, flabbergasted. And it's <laughs> if you've ever had your flabbergasted, you know how painful that is. But to think that one's own peers.